Hello and welcome to a, another episode of the Construction Corner Podcast. I'm Dylan, I'm your host, and we do have a, an awesome guest for you guys today. But first, Matt, we are busy. And I must say that is a good thing, man. Um, we are just talking before about how busy we are. I mean, what's, uh, what's going on in, in your neck of the woods? Busy is, is an understatement these days, man. I, I need like three of myself right now. It seems like, you know, it, it's a good problem to have because it means the industry is still booming and projects are still coming online, but it's, it's crazy. It's probably the craziest I've ever seen it. Like there's, there's no letting up and there hasn't been for two years. So I, I, I'm not complaining. Don't get me wrong. I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm jet setting and uh, I must say in all the travel that I've been doing here lately, like the airports are full, the planes are full. Um, everything is booked out and I was trying to book a last minute flight and like most of the flights are booked up to fly out uh, this weekend. So um, all, I guess, good indicators in the economy and it going strong and construction uh, continuing to, to build. That's why we got to get you that jet. <laughs> we're working on it, man. We are. We're working on it for sure. <clears throat> All right, guys, without, uh, without further ado, we have an awesome guest for you today, Coleman Jones, who's uh, from a small town in Northern California. And just remember, Northern California is basically anything north of LA, which is like 75% of the state. But actual Northern California, even geographically, uh, Coleman raised through hard work and determination, which we uh, would totally love to hear on uh, on this show and uh, instilling everybody you know whether it's hammering out dents painting vehicles uh cleaning cars just all sorts of good hard work uh got his bachelor in science in construction management from california state university in chico which uh if you haven't ever been to chico it is a beautiful place um they've had some problems with fires in the last years but it's a it's an amazing place uh, and you should definitely add it to the list to visit after marrying his high school sweetheart, a uh, week after graduation, moved to uh, Sacramento, where he joined Rudolph and Sletten, uh, which is one of California's largest and most respected commercial contractors. After 11 years uh, with RNS, Coleman managed several award winning restoration projects, including medical facilities, data centers, corporate campuses, tenant improvements, demolition and abatement, and uh, probably more challenging projects than uh, we can list. For more than a decade, they're still loving the ride, and uh, he's got two amazing boys and uh, blessed with the opportunity to adopt their niece as well. Focus on family, faith, hard work, which, again, core values that uh, Matt and I both share. So Coleman Jones with uh, Jones and Lombardi, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, man, welcome aboard. You, uh, you may be one of the first GCs that, that we've talked to since I've been on the show. So I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> oh, nice. Sweet. Usually we've, we've got uh, either subcontractors or designers or, you know, residential guys. So I'm, I'm sure we'll have lots to go back and forth on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We mainly, we've done one residential project and that was for a, a commercial client that we do a ton of work with, but yeah, we stay, in the commercial space and that's where we thrive nice yeah us too we've done we did one home in the last five years and it was for our our uh, office manager so that doesn't really count <laughs> right uh well Pullman uh I guess really you've going to school for construction getting a job in construction and now running your own uh general contractor what made you decide to go this route and uh go and get a construction science degree and um, stay for, you know, the better part of two decades? <laughs> it was a, not a direct path. I came out of high school thinking that I wanted to be a computer science major. And so I was in community college doing all of that. And I had an econ teacher that told us one of the assignments was go to the end job that you want and shadow that person for a day. And so to accomplish that task, I did that. 
and I was terrified. I was in this little dark room and there was like 12 people punching out code and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? This is not, not what I want. And so I was a little lost from there. And then the funny thing was my dad had a, a friend that had just bought a Ford GT supercar. And he's like, hey, you wanna go check this car out with me? I was like, uh, yeah, sure. And so we went and we checked this car out and I was like, what do you do? And he's like, oh, I'm a, a residential developer. And I was like, nice. And so I was at Butte College, as Chico State has a construction management program. I'm doing construction management. So I went over there and I, I was kind of lost during high school, but in college, my best friend was my biggest competition. And so we just thrived off of competing against each other through, through college. And it, it built me up huge accolades with the Dean and the college. And at the same time, I'm competing for internships and I do an internship with one of the largest residential contractors. I get out there and after just a few weeks, a couple months, I'm running all the front end stuff and I was bored to death. And I thought, man, I made another mistake. Like these guys out here, my managers are just praising me on how quick I could pick it up. And I'm like, this is easy. This is not what I thought I was getting myself into. So I almost scrapped the school thing and went back to my dad's body shop because he has an automotive repair shop that I started working at in middle school. But then I was like, you know what? <clears throat> I'm going to do one more internship and it's going to be in San Diego and it's going to be with a commercial contractor. So that's all I focused on the next time. And I had multiple offers to go down to San Diego. I ended up interning with Rudolph and Sletten. We were on the Museum of Contemporary Arts in downtown San Diego, and I just fell in love with how difficult and how cool that sort of construction could be. So from there, I hired on with RNS, and I had started building the Kaiser Roseville Women's and Children's Center, which is a four-story, 200 and some thousand dollar project. It's Oshpod governed. There's a neonatal intensive care unit in there. There's operating rooms. There's everything. And so that's kind of what I started cutting my teeth on. From there, did some other really interesting retrofit projects, started managing, moving up the ladder. And I just, I kind of felt like I kept getting suppressed. Like I would have ideas and the executives above me would be like, no, no, too crazy. Don't like it. And just after a lot of that, it, it just sort of felt defeating. I didn't see much vertical movement. I was told that I was ready for the promotion, but I had to go to Bakersfield to run a 200,000 square foot medical office building. And that just doesn't work with my life. Like I'm, I'm dedicated to the family and moving out of town is not what I was about to do because there's so much divorce and construction. There's some, there's just, a, there can be a lot of awful things when you accept uh, a project that's out of town. And so I, I never wanted to be an absent father. I wanted to coach the kids. kids. And so from there, I ended up meeting another guy at Rudolph and Sledden. And we used to hang out on the weekends and have drunk conversations about being able to do this ourselves and blah, blah, blah. And so from there, it just, we started getting serious and started talking about it when we were sober and just started building towards the day that we were going to finally step out on our own. And that was in 2018 when we left the company and, and started on our own. That's surprisingly similar to my story, um, including the drunken conversations, except for the, the guy I was having those conversations with ended up flaking out and went a different direction. But uh, I still had the sober conversations with myself and, and skidded out of there. Um, so how did the old company, and I, I apologize, I forgot their name, but how did they react when, when you and their other employee, your, your now partner, came to them and said, we're, we're now competition, peace out? 
Yeah, that's a funny story. So my business partner, Garrett Lamberti, he left Rudolph and Slutton a couple years before I did. He went to to Boga Winery and started to be their construction facilities manager. So I actually took over his project. And when we were ready to leave, another guy in the industry that used to work for the same company, he left, started his own business. He leaked it to the the senior VP of the office that we were starting this thing and we were leaving. So I never actually had the opportunity to fully go in front of the the big boss without, he already knew when I was coming. Like I, I reached out to him and said, Hey, we need to have a conversation. I went in there, sat down and he said, so what are you going to tell me that, that you and Garrett are going out on your own? And it was like <laughs> blindsided moment. Right. I, I was like, uh, yep, that's why I'm here. <laughs> but all in all, they've been supported. We don't, we haven't, we don't take any work from them. I mean, they do a billion dollars in California. They're union, we're non-union. And so we, I respect the hell out of them. They've given me this opportunity where I'm at. They've taught me, they've, they've allowed me to grow and learn. And without them, I would be, uh, way way further behind that's cool it's always nicer when it works out that way versus them you know looking out to to crush you or something do they, do they ever hand work to you like stuff that's either they can't handle or they don't want no i mean there's been talks because i know a lot of people in the larger companies that have moved from that company and, and there's been talks about other work but no nothing there's nothing been handed to us. <laughs> you know how it goes. Oh yeah, I get it. I, I brought it up because when I when I left my former company, uh, we had those talks, and actually we we set up a program, and you know they they like to call it they were going to give me their scraps, and uh, I left, and one of their clients followed me, and I went back. I met with my with the owner of the company, and I said, hey, I got got to be straight up with you. You know this guy is calling me, and I won't pursue him if you tell me not to, but I'm just, you know, man to man, we're going to talk about this. That was the last day I talked to any of those guys and I never got those scraps. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. so I get it's it. Fun. It's made you better off. Cause I mean, it could have been a, a, like no strings attached thing, but then on the other end, it could be where they tried to hold something over you. And then you have to have that hard conversation too. So, I mean, it's always better to just cut ties I, I don't even, I was there for 11 plus years and I don't talk to anybody there. Yeah, I agree, man. There are never no strings attached. Yeah, exactly. In, I guess some of the starting phases of when you guys went off on your own, like help walk us through what, uh, what those initial years looked like and Obviously, you know, you're, you've been around a while now, but for those first few years for anybody that's getting started or maybe thinking about going out on their own, obviously you, you knew what to do. You knew the processes. Uh, it's another thing to build your own systems, but um, if you want to kind of maybe help us walk through what that looked like and just uh, maybe <laughs> how hard and, and the reality of uh, going out and starting your own own deal. Oh, it's easy. You just like, you, you make a website and then people just start pouring in. <laughs> our, our first project was, it came through Garrett from Bogle, the, the head winemaker, knew, had a buddy in the St. Helena area that made corks for wineries. And they were looking for a construction manager, not a GC. They needed somebody to watch over their GC. And we kind of finagled our way in like, hey, we're, we have a, a co company, we have a business and we can totally do this. And so we, we worked our way in with that. So we, we proposed as a construction manager to watch over a contractor that we now compete with, <laughs> which, which is a whole different story. And when we got that that yes from the company it was like well we can't do our day job 
in focus on our company at the same time. So it is, it is right now we're drawing the line. We have to leave because when you're doing that sort of thing, it, it just doesn't work doing it as a side hustle. Yeah. So before that we had, we had gone through different things. Like my wife and I did the, the Dave Ramsey, Ramsey financial peace university and like paid off all of our debt, saved up a ton of money, like more money than we needed. But at the same time, we were super afraid of leaving like a, 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 a salary where I was making, you know, six figures and then gas card and car allowance and bonuses, all this stuff. It was just like, it was scary. So with that background, that foundation, financially, I knew that I was good for like two years. Like if I don't get a paycheck for two years, I'll be good. <clears throat> but we got this CM job in and we decided to take it. The owner actually did not like me. I was going to manage it. And because Gary thought there was a little bit of, of conflict with Bogle. And so he was he was wanting me to do it and I was all for it. The owner didn't like me. And he said, the only way that I'll do this deal is with Garrett. <laughs> so we're like, <laughs> all right, that's fine. So we got that down. And so I leave RNS and then I am at my house and I'm going from managing millions of dollars and a substantial team to sitting in my dining room converted over to an office with nobody around me all day, nobody to manage and thinking, Oh my God, what, what did I get myself into? What, what do I do? And so I just started reaching out to contacts that I had in the past. And it was one of the most difficult things because I've never been really good at telling you how good I am at what I do. I've always kind of been more, more humble and wanted to prove it, but you can't get an opportunity if you don't ask for it. And so that was the hardest thing, like just making a bunch of cold calls and we were leaning on our, our past mentors. Also, we had a great guy that, that mentored Garrett at Rudolph and Sutton. He was, Garrett worked for him and he would introduce us to people we didn't know and he would invite like we would set up lunch and we'd go out and we would talk to the contact and it was commercial developers it was space planners it was designers and we'd have lunch with them and then ask for an opportunity and then they would provide that opportunity and so we just kept doing that work in our relationships and then making cold calls and i remember one of the first jobs that we did i had been pressing the parents of one of my kids, uh, my my oldest son was playing baseball, I forget what, like double A or something, and knew that one of his teammates' parents worked for this big company out in Rancho. And so I kept like hounding them like, hey, how do I get in? How do I get in? How do I get in? And so finally, after a few months, I got, we got invited to bid one of their projects. And so we, we did a job walk. And I was in the middle of bidding this project and the facilities guy calls me out of the blue Saturday morning and says, my demo guy can't come and demo these bathrooms and I have tile going in Monday. Can you demo these bathrooms over the weekend? And I was like, yeah, we'll make it happen. So I made some calls and we were able to make that happen. And then that turned into more work and more work with with that company, but it was just Garrett and myself all of 2018. And we were able to, to do about 750,000 that year in revenue without anybody else. And then we moved into the next year to where we like doubled and hired our first person and then fired our first person and then hired two more guys. And, and from there, it's just been kind of walking our way up. That's awesome. So what, what kind of does the company profile look like today? How many employees do you have? And do you guys self-perform work or are you just management and supervision? 
We are mainly management supervision in self-perform minor things. We have seven guys out in the field, 11 total on payroll. And so if there's like miscellaneous demo cleanup, miscellaneous framing installation, things like that we'll do, but we, we had, we've never taken out any loans or debt on the company. We, we both just put a few thousand dollars into this bank account and then we built up from there. So we, we would, we had thought about self-performing things that just requires more capital. And if you don't have the capital internally, you have to go out and get it externally or you build yourself up. And so we're working on building ourselves up. So is your, is your target to eventually self-perform? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, possibly, I mean, we have, it's, it's hard to think that because we work with the same subcontractors over and over and over again. And that's, that's where I was going. Yeah. (laughs) Like it's a relationship thing. And it, I, I don't know if I would take on full trades, maybe more like miscellaneous stuff or, or like if our demo guy is too busy, like our guys will roll in and they'll demo something, you know, things like that. But I really, we really like, and we really value the relationships that we've built over the past years with our, our subcontract group. Oh, and, that, and that's huge. I mean, we sound like we're very similar, um, companies anyways and you know that that's our big thing too and you you can't replace those relationships and we've toyed with the idea you know of of starting a a small carpentry unit you know for for really small stuff but but even that like I've got carpenters we've worked with for 30 plus years as a firm you know I I don't know there's always that weird animosity like do I go to carpenter a and say hey by the way I'm going to start banging a hammer now but don't worry we're not really competing and yeah, I don't know. We, we've just always kind of voted that it's it's better to do what we do best and, and let our guys, our bigger team, do what they do. Yeah, I would say, like, we need our business, our guys, we need to, like, true up, fix our, the places that we're lacking before we ever decide to, to step out and do something else. Like, there's so much improvement that we could do internally before we pick pick up more oh for sure i i was poking around your uh your linkedin site and you had an article there from the sacramento business journal and they were listing your at least what they estimated your revenue to be for like 18 19 and 20 and um whether it's completely accurate or not you guys are are flying off the charts from what it looks like yeah yeah we were recognized for the fastest growing company in the sacramento area for 18, 19, 20, but when you're a startup and you have $750,000 in revenue and then you go up to $8 million, it's like, it's, it's substantial. I will tell you that last year, 2021, we went into the, to the year with a $3.7 million ground up on the books and then three other warm shell ground up on the books. So we were going into the year with seven and a half, eight million dollars worth of work. <clears throat> and so we kind of took our foot off the gas pedal. We brought guys in to fill those projects and those projects never happened. And mm. it took us a good eight months, 10 months to rebound from that. And we kept all of our guys on payroll. We doubled them up, tripled them up on projects where, you know, technically we shouldn't have. We probably should have laid some guys off, but it's like, we're trying to build a family. So we took the hit, the company took a, a huge hit last year and it was, it was difficult. I mean, it was definitely one to remember that I'll, I'll never, never do that again. So it was thankful we were able to make it out without too much, but we did take some steps back because we were getting ready to buy a building to move into our operations into. And we used our capital to keep everybody going because they have families, they have mortgages. And so it was, it was just a learning thing. We, right now we're just, we were so aggressive and we never want to get into that situation again. So we'll figure out how to do the work. But back then 
we felt like we had the work. And so it was, all right, let's prepare to get ready to do this and not so much focus on getting more work in because we were like, how are we going to do all this work already? So it was definitely a learning curve. And last year, honestly, it was mentally as difficult. You get you get recognized for the fastest growing company and your revenue is just way lower from the year before. And it's, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. It's those lumps though, that you, you take those lumps and you grow from them. You know, I mean, that's, you found out the holes in the boat theory really quick. It sounds like, and you know, we, we do the same thing and, my business partner and I will will argue frequently because we have a pretty nice backlog of work right now. And he's more of that mindset, like, okay, let's just focus on what we have on paper and, and keep doing it and, and building. But I kind of have that, you know, no, no effing way. I, I got my foot on the gas. We're going to keep filling those coffers because the, the biggest thing about a construction company is that beast it is a hungry son of a gun and it is always hungry. And if you don't keep feeding it, the whole thing falls apart real fast. Exactly. I mean, you grow, you scale, your overhead gets, it's all, you bring on a new guy and then you're paying that. And it's always scary when your overhead grows and grows and grows. And it's like, oh my gosh, I have to bring in this much money to make sure that we're, we're clearing payroll. And you, I need to have, this much reserve in that account just to make me feel comfortable. But at the same time, it's like, that's what you have to do. You always have to keep pushing forward hard, getting more projects, scaling the, the company. <clears throat> so over, well, you even talked about it in, in, you know, having a tough year last year, how important the relationship with your team was, as well as your, your trades, your contractors, your trade partners, your clients, the mentors that you have, how big of a role have relationships played into really everything that you've been doing? Oh, relationships are key. We're not a we're not a public works contractor, so we don't go in, we don't do a lot of low bid change order stuff. We, we do some work for the city of Sacramento and we have a great relationship with them. We actually have some on-call contracts and we have one project with them right now. But all in all, the majority, most of all of our work is relationships and repeat business and recommendations from others and referrals so that's where we we like to say so it is it is like the most important thing relationships are the biggest thing it's never about one project it's always about getting making sure that we've exceeded expectations on this project so they want to work with us on the next project and give us opportunities for the next 20 30 40 years people buy from people they know like and trust i mean that's yeah. uh and with when you're in charge of you know millions of dollars worth of construction and building that's uh you know pretty high bar you know you want to make sure that you're really uh trustworthy and and obviously even from your first client with like bogle to where you know the, the owner liked your partner better and uh that's who they went with right and uh having them on so i could you know totally you know from personal experience those the stories you're telling that uh you know they keep coming back to the people that they know so how have you guys dealt with hiring um i mean i know you just said you, you kept all those guys on through the last year and that's that's awesome that's really admirable but i i guess if you're looking for people now or you know back when you were in, before when you were looking for people how did you kind of broach those waters? Was it a difficult process to find the right people? You sound like you're, you're a pretty culture-driven organization. So was that, a, was that a difficult spot to fill in any of those roles? Yeah, absolutely. It's always difficult to bring people in, especially with the, the work environment right now. Everybody claims that they have all the experience in the world. They want 
a huge salary or hourly wage and they just they don't have it they don't they don't have the base skills that we would look for or expect at a certain level so it's very difficult we've used online hiring ads we've reached out to people that we've known in the past we've looked everywhere and it is we still we struggle with it yeah it's it's been brutal um i mean we're we're currently running a an online campaign now trying to find people and it's it's just what you said either you, you get the people who are probably qualified but they want you know 200 grand for a starting uh, you know a greenhorn or they're not even close we get we get so many civil engineers applying to to work with us and nothing against civil engineers but that's not what we do guys like wh where are you coming from here you know we we need somebody with a certain skill set and it's just it's brutal it's absolutely yeah. brutal yeah or we'll get somebody from the trades that that was like doing fire sprinklers or something and they're like i can i'm a superintendent it's like well okay you maybe you kicked ass in your world but gc world is way different than single trade world and or or they'll say that they've been running jobs forever and they are a superintendent and they can't provide a simple schedule and like that's that's the biggest thing like you, you tell me you're a superintendent here's my laptop and build me a quick schedule because you should be able to do it in three to five minutes oh yeah i agree have it's you had funny. a deal go ahead it's funny because we we've had we've done that we've we've hired somebody and we didn't we we made the mistake we didn't test them and it it's almost like they don't know that we know what we're doing Garrett and I have been in deeply involved learning every single aspect now we don't know everything but we know enough to to know how to do everything needed for a project so if you're coming in and telling us that you could do this and then you provide something that is like my my son could do it's <laughs> it's kind of it's very frustrating yeah absolutely um have you had to deal with with either friends or family coming to you for to try and, and score those those seats at the table Mm, not so much. I have my little brother still works for the company that I came from at RNS. He hasn't specifically said bring me on. And I don't know. I I grew up working for my dad in a body shop. My older and younger brother, they both worked there. I saw how insane that was and what I do and how professional this company needs to be. There is no room for any sort of family drama or anything like that. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, I've never seen it really work well when people bring in family. Um, you had mentioned, you know, the sub subcontractors asking you or, or trying to tell you they're qualified. We deal with that a lot. Um, and it's a tricky situation too, right? Because it's, I'm friends with a lot of these guys. And so now I've, you know, I've got one in particular that's, that's asking me if, if he can come work for us because he sees we're hiring and having that conversation with someone that, you know, you, I do know, like, and trust the guy. However, he's just not the right fit and he never will be. And trying to put that in terms that don't, doesn't come off like a giant asshole is, is a little tricky sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, it can be difficult. I would say that for our projects that we're doing right now between you have a few hundred actually between ten dollars and and million a few million dollars if you get the smaller jobs you get a three hundred thousand dollar job if you have the right person they just don't know but they're willing to learn as long as you you teach them you lead them you give them the systems and processes then that person is the guy that i like because we can help grow them into the person that can run these multi-million dollar projects yeah absolutely finding culture fits first and then uh, teaching all the skills 
after, uh, and then having those systems in place to easily teach makes uh, the whole process <laughs> a whole lot better. Uh, Coleman, before we uh, kind of have some wrap up questions, where can everybody find you? Well, if they need my services, they can go on my website at jnlbuilders.com. I'm on Instagram at, I think it's coolman underscore Jones. I think that's what it is. But yeah, I'm so focused on, on work that I'm starting to try and post more about the business and the industry. But right now, it's just <laughs> the days just are slammed. I get it, man. I get it. And uh, guys, we'll put all, everything in the in the show notes uh, below. Uh, Coleman, one of the big things that we like to ask our guests is, uh, and we've covered maybe some of this here today, but uh, what's maybe the biggest problem that you see in the industry? And then what can we do uh, together to try to help solve it? I think the biggest problem in the industry is that the tradesmen positions have been downplayed over the last several decades. Like it's not a good thing. It's not honorable to be in the trades and that is complete BS. I mean, we need, we need qualified people. Everybody does to help build these projects. And so I think that's one of the things I think a lot of entitlement is th rampant throughout every industry. People just want so much and they think that owners sit at the top of this hill or this mountain that was made out of money and we're just like hanging out up there, just, you know, raking it in while they're building the company for us. And, you know, that's just not the truth. We work so much harder than everybody in at least our organization but it's one of those things that we chose to do. Like, I don't complain about it. I don't tell everybody that I work so many hours a week. I don't, I work weekends. It's like, that's what I, that's what I want. That's what, where I feel alive. I'm building a big thing that I left. The reason that I left was because I wanted to build a company, not just projects. So I want to build this, this company big enough to where, these guys can elevate their lives within this umbrella that we are. And so entitlement just erodes that not being patient, not understanding that success comes with a lot of hard work over a long period of time is just, it's difficult because I, we have conversations with our guys all the time. And one of the things that Ed Milet said on Arte a few weeks ago was like outlast the temporary, you know, it's, I don't know if you picked up on that. Cause I know you guys are in Arte and it's like, if you're able to outlast the temporary, it's, it's going to get better. Everything is difficult in the moment. And so if you can work through that, the only people that fail are the ones that quit. So just get up and do it and keep going. You know? So I, I think that's, that's a big thing. I think there's issues with, with the, the the title of tradesman, that's negative, which it definitely isn't. All these guys have earned my respect. And then entitlement and laziness is, is rampant. I, I wholeheartedly agree. We, we talk about that a ton and it's, <laughs> as, a, as a society, we need to make some serious <sighs> changes about how we, we view and, and rate different professions and and different, you know, occupations. Yeah. Even today I put out a episode where talking about basically this exact thing where a lot of, um, you, I, specifically for like DBEs that were entitled or get work for not doing anything. And that's been a, you know, from a design side where you, you know, at the end of the day, we have to pick up the slack for them to make sure that, you know, design gets out and everything else, but it's still a, uh, across the board that, you know, at the end of the day, construction one in learning your craft, it takes years to get enough reps in on the same skill or trade or portion of your project, right? Like you don't lay concrete every day. So to get enough reps to, to do it or do ties or to, 
design a building from an electrical standpoint, like you don't do the same things every day and you might not have enough reps in your projects to gain the skills, right? Which why it takes so much longer within construction to gain the skill sets that you need to be great at your job. So for, I think a lot of the coming up in the industry is that they're, they're used to things happening so fast where with us, it, it's a longer time horizon because of the, the rep cycles for doing a, a specific project, right? Like for some of the big projects you talk about in 200,000 square feet, you know, that's <laughs> 24 month build cycles, you know, or, mm -hmm. or 18 to 30 months, depending on what's getting put up. Like it's a long cycle to go through and then to see enough of those, right? It, you've got to go through 10 years uh, yeah. to see enough cycles. And then the other thing that like we really talk about is, you know, construction, it's a great industry that you can make great money in that you can build a real career in. It's not going anywhere. You can't export construction <laughs> overseas. You know, it's always going to be here. And then on top of that, like that it's, you're building the communities around you, you know, uh, as long as you <laughs> do a good job, that building should last for, you know, decades to come. Right. And it's something that you can tell uh, your family, like, I'm sure that anybody uh, or anyone in their family that worked on like the Empire State Building, they tell that story of, you know, my whatever grandfather or whoever was, a, or my great uncle Tom <laughs> was the guy that hung steel, you know, for the Empire State Building, or maybe a more recent project would have been Freedom Tower or some of the, you know, bigger buildings in, in your city. Somebody's telling that story that they were a part of building the communities around you, you know, whether that's in downtown Sacramento and the Capitol building to, you know, downtown Detroit and GM tower, right. Those, those stories are rampant through the community and it's something to be proud of at the end of the day. And I think we often lose sight of that too, as a, as a community. Yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's an industry built on pride, right. Built on the backs of, hardworking people. And uh, I mean, that's why we're doing this. We're doing this to try and change that, that viewpoint and, and bring back that, that pride, bring back the, you know, the confidence in the trades and, you know, make the trades cool again. Awesome. Coleman, any, uh, any final thoughts for our, our listeners? Sure. Let me think. I would say that if, if you're considering starting a company, construction, subcontractor, engineering, anything like that, just know that it is more work than you think that you put in right now, like exponentially more. And at the same time, it is more rewarding than anything you do right now. So if that is your passion, if you want to own your own thing, don't wait to set specific goals in motion now to start something and just do it. And hard work will eventually help you with your business and grow it. If you don't want to own a business, understand that the people that do own that business work incredibly hard if you have a good leader incredibly hard to keep that thing running and so I just would think like there's some perspective that individuals need it is wonderful owning my own thing I am so glad that I'm not under the the watchful eyes of executives anymore but at the same time it's definitely a trade-off I, I lose time with my families but or my family but I have to compartmentalize the time. I don't have multiple families. <laughs> I have to compartmentalize my time. I, I have to be really strict about my time and I run really hard. And then when I'm with them, my family, I give them full attention. It's been amazing. And thank you guys for having me on. That's, that's perfect, man. I, I couldn't have said it better. Coleman, thank you for joining us today. It was, it was a good conversation. Thank you. Yeah, Coleman, thank you so much for coming on. And, and guys, a uh, lot of lessons in here, a lot of gems on really what it takes to start, 
what it takes to go and get uh, projects, you know, both through relationships, through cold calls, <laughs> through some uncomfortable uh, things that you maybe don't want to do, uh, late nights, weekends, and, and hard work and determination to provide for, for a team and their families and everyone around you. So Coleman, thank you for doing what, what you do and, and building great projects and providing for your team and their families. Um, and really be an example for the construction community and coming on and sharing your story of really what it takes to, you know, have something to continue to build and provide for, uh, again, your team members and the community at large and provide those jobs and work for all the, the trade partners and subs that you do work with. So again, thank you so much for coming on and guys share the show. If you enjoyed it, if you got something out of it outside of that, we will see you right back here next week. That is this episode of the Construction Corner Podcast. Until next time.